Nou, dames en heren, van harte welkom bij deze 25e Grand Round. Het is een groot genoeg om mede namens de Raad van Bestuur u alle welkom te heten op dit initiatief dat we een jaar of twee, drie geleden starten. En wat wel een succes genoemd mag worden, gezien ook weer de opkomst van vandaag. Heel even kort nog over de, de Grand Rounds. Uh, ik zei het al, de 25e. Ik heb toch even in het archief gekeken en gezien dat we inmiddels 13 externe sprekers hebben gehad. Uh, waarvan drie uh, uit het buitenland, vandaag dus uit Engeland en twee uit Amerika en de rest interne sprekers. Variërend van mensen zoals Han Brunner, Han van Krieken, Didi Braat, Gert Westert. Uh, nou en ga zo maar door. Uh, de externe sprekers, uh, nou ja, variërend van de wethouder tot en met uh, op dit moment misschien niet zo uh, chic, maar niet zo, in ieder geval wel hot, uh, de voorzitter van de NZA, Theo Langejan, die overigens begon met de Grand Rounds. Gemiddeld hadden we rond de 120 uh, bezoekers uh, bij elke Grand Round, dus toch wel bijna zo'n zo 3000 mensen die inmiddels de, uh, de Grand Rounds hebben bezocht. Kortom, uh, ja, fijn dat u er bent, fijn dat we dit met u allen kunnen vieren, de 25e Grand Round. En dat is voor mij reden om nu naar het Engels uh, over te gaan. Fiona Gottlieb will be the presenter of the 25th uh, Gra Grand Round. We are very, very happy that she is here. Uh, she, uh, together with Tessa Richards, uh, Tessa is uh, associate editor of the British Medical Journal and Fiona is the chief editor of the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, one of the leading journals in the world uh, uh, in our field. And uh, Lucien and I visited London, I think, two months ago, Fiona, and uh, we were invited to be a member of uh, a group who advised uh, the editorial board of the BMG with their new uh, program, Patient Partnership. And uh, Lucien and I, and also Fiona and Tessa, say a remarkable, uh, that, that the things that we were doing in our two organizations were remarkable the same, and we, have, uh, we can learn a lot of them. And, and they can maybe learn uh, small things of us. And that's why we uh, intended to uh, invite uh, Fiona and Tessa to uh, Nijmegen. Tomorrow there will be a, a Radboud Reshape uh, workshop. Some of you may have subscribed to that meeting. If you haven't uh, do that until now, you have done that until now, you, um, I advise you to do that because it is very promising what tomorrow will happen. Um, now we will. Now Fiona will talk about patient partnership, and uh, we look forward to this grand round because, especially since your last editorial, which has the title "Let the Patient Revolution Begin." Fiona, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. It's an enormous honour to be here, and um, I want people to know this is water in those glasses here, uh, in case that's on video. I, I hope to consume all of this during the talk. Um, um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. I wanted to ask just for my information, and also, yes, delighted my colleague Tessa Richards here, who, who has been leading on a lot of the things I will be talking about. Um, can I just ask for my information how many physicians and surgeons are in the room, if you would just raise your hands? And how many non-physician healthcare workers, so nurses and others, are here? Ooh, I don't know what this means. You're something interesting. Thank you. And how many who are neither physicians, surgeons, or other healthcare workers are in the room? Ah, that's fantastic. Okay. So how many of you who have just raised your hand are patients? Uh, how would you define? I was going to thank you. I was going to thank you for that. So all of us, yeah? <laughs> All of us, are well, I mean, at some point in our lives. Um, we obviously hope that that will be not a great big part of our lives, but obviously all of us are patients. And I think um, some of the issues that I certainly deal with as editor of the BMJ and you're dealing with here are to do with that perception that is the problem, that we don't think in that way, um, especially if we've been medically trained or trained as healthcare workers. I come from a very medical family. Everyone in my family is a doctor. You can't move in my household for doctors. Um, my father comes from a very medical family. His ancestors go back to um, Joseph Lister and the Quakers in the UK were very strong medical um, tradition. My father was a doctor. Um, my siblings are all doctors um, and I was a doctor. Uh, my poor mother is the only, was the only one who wasn't a doctor and she had the, the saying at the end of a long meal, she would push her plate away and say, another meal ruined <laughs> because, of the <laughs> because of the conversation. So my mother had a rather ambivalent attitude towards doctors and on the one hand I think she was very pleased to have bred a, a, a dynasty, a new dynasty of, of medic, medical 
people. And, and the status of doctors, I think she found very nice, and she would, she would use it in all sorts of appropriate and inappropriate circumstances, like if she was being given a parking ticket. She would say, you must wait for my husband, Dr. Godley, he is coming. You know, and <laughs> use it to hope to, to, to um, make a play on it. But I think she was also very ambivalent about doctors and um, didn't really want to go to see them if she could avoid it at all. And, um, and yet, one, one, one thing that I was very conscious of was when she was dying, the, um, the, uh, n the hope that she would have just a, a doctor with her at that time. And I think our poor general practitioner was so horrified. My father a doctor, my siblings are all general practitioners. I'm the editor-in-chief of the BMJ. He was nowhere to be seen. I think he felt it was all too, too frightening. Um, so one experience for me of that was that the nursing care was so fantastic and so essential and that doctors themselves may not be always the best people for any one situation. And I think certainly at the BMJ, since we are a journal for doctors, we, we, we navigate that, that issue between what is, what is the doctor's role and what is the nursing and other role in, in healthcare it is an interesting one to navigate. So in addition to the experience of being with my mother when she was dying, and, and it was a very positive experience from the nursing point of view, a less positive one from the doctor point of view, we've all, I'm sure, had experiences both good and bad as, as both patients, as... Um, family members of, of patients. And um, it seems that um, a lot of the time we get it wrong, the medical profession and medicine. Maybe, oh, I wanted, I tried to find an image of, of non-patient-centered care, and this was the best I could come up with. This is, I'm sure that in the old days, many hospitals were like this. I certainly worked in one where the sister would come and tuck you up in bed and make you sit up straight for the ward round. Um, and you would wait, and then the doctor would come, and you would feel very honoured that the doctor had come. You wouldn't remember what he said, but it was very nice to be visited. And um, then the nurse would come along afterwards and explain what had happened. Um, it seems to me that this picture represents the status of the doctor, the patients awaiting, the, um, the power imbalance of, of traditional medicine, the patients awaiting, the doctor has the knowledge, the doctor has the power. Um, everyone is, 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 is doctor-centred. Um, and, and also, um, there are, although not in this picture, often medical students waiting around um, to, to be told what to do by the senior members of the team. And that is, is part of the medical training traditionally, and I think still in many cultures, where the empathy that, the, the empathy that a student would normally feel towards the patient in the bed is slowly eroded as a result of their training. They want to impress their senior colleagues, so they want to behave like the senior colleagues, so, so the, the, the culture continues. Um, obviously there's time pressure, the doctor's time is precious, the patient's time is less precious, that's what being patient seems to mean. Um, there's a lot of fear, the, medic, the doctors are frightened not to know things, the doctors are frightened um, uh, to be, uh, appear to be indecisive, or, um, and there's a lot of ignorance about what it feels like to be a patient, because most doctors come from status situation and 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 i'm perhaps less likely to be patients um and all of the processes around um trying to have an efficient system uh, in the uk certainly we have uh, not a very efficient system and this is a diagram i don't know if you can see this that was created for the king's fund which is actually an animated video you can go online and see it and, and it's drawn in pieces showing the new this is the reformed nhs this is after the reforms um, and um, down here at the bottom, we have the, all the patients and the public and all these different bodies now involved in trying to deliver health care so that not only do you have the power imbalance and all the things I've mentioned about why doctors have the upper hand, but you have this incredibly complex system that the patients are having to navigate, uh, fragmented, moving from one part of it to another. Um, so, so this, I mean, I don't need to tell you this because you are in, an, in a hospital where, maybe I do, I need to remind you that not everyone is in the position that Radboud is in, that, that this is a bit unique and this is why Tessa and I are here. This is a unique place. Um, I know that other hospitals and, and health systems doing similar good work, but very often the ward round, the power imbalance and the uh, confusing health system are much more normal. And, and things that we want to try to change. Very hard to change it. 
Uh, I know that Radboud has made an amazing journey in the last six, seven years, and we're here to learn from you about that. Um, but first of all, I suppose we need to ask ourselves, why should we change? Why the need to change? And again, you may not need to hear this, but others may be less convinced. Well, I would say, obviously, first off, it's the right thing to do. And, and that, that seems to be almost um, one good enough reason. It's, it's the right thing to do. But we need to ask ourselves whether it works. And um, I just wanted to draw attention to some work that's been done by National Voices, or it's published in National Voices just this week. Tessa um, drew my attention to this. Um, and Angela Coulter, who is a woman who has done amazing work in this area over many years. She worked for the Picker Institute and has done a great deal of building the evidence base for patient-centered care. She's done a, an extraordinary job, and she's just published on the National Voices website the results of that work so far. So she explains in a blog that has just been posted on bmj.com, she explains that they started in 2006 trying to collect together uh, evidence on patient-focused interventions. And um, that was a very wide definition. Um, and in 2006, they found four systematic reviews, only four. So they thought they were quite pleased by that. Um, they've just done it again, and now in 2014, 10 years, well, eight years later, there are 779 systematic reviews. So the evidence for looking at this is very, very large. And um, the actual things they were looking at were supporting self-management, any intervention that was about supporting self-management, anything that was about supporting shared decision-making, anything that was about experiencing, enhancing experience of healthcare, so anything that would improve the patient's experience of healthcare, anything that would about, was about increasing information and understanding of patients of healthcare and then anything about promoting prevention. So quite a broad uh, canvas. And the conclusions from this latest summary of these nearly 780 systematic reviews um, has been threefold in, a, in very brief terms. So uh, they've concluded that information is an effective strategy. So if you give people information about their care, it will improve their um, experience of the care and um, come up with better outcomes. They've also concluded that patient involvement causes, uh, leads to better clinical decisions. So that's, that's a very important conclusion um, because I think so often people will say, well, why do we need to do this? Well, it improves clinical decisions. And they've also found that integrating, integrated self-management works better. Um, it works best. So if you have self-management, but it's actually integrated into the care system, then you get better, better results. And Angela Coulter and her colleagues have asked, well, why isn't this happening now? If we've got all this evidence, this hard work evaluating uh, these things. Well, uh, she concludes, uh, or rather she describes the current situations in the UK. And taking that last one first, integration of self-care works best. She finds that only 3% of patients have um, a, a formal care plan. So this is a plan about their, what's going to happen to them in their, in their treatment. So only 3% of patients have that. Uh, she finds that in terms of patients' involvement, um, patients do want, they want to be involved in their care, but very, very few of them feel that they are. And in terms of the information, she finds that, or they find that, um, patients find it very difficult to work out what information is reliable and what information is, is not reliable. And we do not have a good system yet of, of, of stamping the information you can trust as opposed to the information that you should ignore. Now, this leads me on to the BMJ because we are, we hope, about information and we hope that we are about information that's reliable. Um, and, uh, but I think one thing I should say from the outset, many people would see us as part of the establishment. We are, we are, we are medicine, we are the voice of medicine in some areas. And, and one of the things that I think we have struggled with is whether we are for doctors or whether we are for patients. And we have come after many, many attempts to, to unpick this. We always come back to saying we're for doctors. We're a, we're a, doc, we're a journal that doctors will read. But we want to be a journal that will push, push, push doctors to behave 
in the way that is best for patients. And that is, is a, an, interesting, an interesting dynamic. So for a long time, we have, um, we have pushed for things like research papers that report outcomes that matter to patients, so that instead of the serum cholesterol, we would talk about the heart attacks. Um, we would talk about the clinical, the clinical change that would make a difference to the patient. And we were quite early on, I think, to really insist that all of our research focused on the outcomes that matter to patients. And we've continued that fight. We've continued to try to avoid surrogate markers that can be used to make it seem like medicines are better than they are. You use surrogate outcome measures like a blood pressure or a, um, or a, or a blood test. Um, it can make the treatment look better than it really is. So we've been, I think, early in that. We've, we've, we've pushed for, for, for a while. Um, but a, a few years ago, we decided we needed to go further, and we wanted to um, encourage this sense of participation between doctors and patients and, and to see it as a partnership. And this, this was, um, the date was 1999, and Tessa was the editor of this theme issue, uh, where we looked at a number of different aspects of how we could um, encourage doctors to see patient partnership as a positive thing. And that's a long time ago, 1999. It seems um, like history, but, but it was seen as very radical then. And I think if you look back at the content now, it's quite upsetting to realize how much of it still is relevant now, that that idea of doctors embracing, wanting to welcome patients into their decision-making is, is, is surprisingly challenging for them even now. So we published the theme issue, and we've continued with other, other things. We've had, uh, over a period of time, what we call patient journeys, which are um, written again. They're by patients, but they're for doctors, and they are patients describing what it was like to be a patient in, in a certain circumstance, with a doctor giving the medical side, but the patient really trying to teach doctors about what it feels like to be a patient, the, the fear, the uncertainty, the errors being made, um, the lack of communication with the family members, whatever, all of these issues again and again and again with a different medical condition, but the same, same stories coming through. We also looked at this rather fascinating idea of, of the disruption that medicine causes in people's lives. And um, Victor Montori and others looked at the amount of time patients were involved in, in healthcare. So people with a chronic condition, it becomes a full-time job, uh, especially if you go back to that chart of the fragmented health system. So they're going to the general practitioner one day, then the next day they have to go and get a test, and then they have to go back to get the result, then they have to sit in a waiting room. Again, I think, Radboud, your patients won't experience this, but in many, many parts of the world, <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we'll hear later. Um, they, they may experience it less here than they might in other cultures. And certainly in the UK, that has been a factor. Um, and um, Victor Montori is based at the Mayo Clinic in the US. And very much some of the stories he was reporting were of patients spending... They, they could no longer afford to work because they were just professional patients. Not by choice, not by choice. So this is an issue that we've been very interested in, and it's led us towards quite a few of our other campaigns. One in particular is this idea of, of too much medicine, that we need to be clear. Medicine needs to be in proportion to its effectiveness, and it mustn't become this thing that is an end in itself. Uh, we also have been listening a great deal to, or, or, or in more recent years, to what you might call professional patients. Uh, and Tessa Richards has been really helpful in, in, in alerting us to the number of people out there who are online um, doing an extraordinary job of summarizing their own condition, tweeting, blogging, writing about it, drawing people in. And, and this is one um, such person, Kelly, who's, who calls herself RA Warrior. She's a rheumatoid arthritis warrior. And she um, is has has... I, I, I think I'm right in saying now 2% of all patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, are reading her blog on a regular basis. So she's got an amazing following in America and now worldwide. And what she's finding is that um, as a result of this activity, uh, the, the understanding of doctors of rheumatoid arthritis as a condition is changing at last. So 
the things that people thought, that the doctors thought were important, which were about joint swelling, about joint erosion, um, about um, some of the other connective tissue problems, some of the blood conditions, the, the chronic um, cyst, uh, organ, organ problems that result from it, were obviously problematic, but the one thing that was not counted for was fatigue. And that the, if you ask patients about what it feels like to have rheumatoid arthritis, debilitating fatigue is the thing that they really care about. And so as a result, I think I'm right in saying, of, of her work and the work of those who she works with, the idea of fatigue as a major symptom and problem for people with rheumatoid arthritis is now um, beginning to be properly recognized. So she's an extraordinary person. She's working with us at the BMJ, I'm glad to say. Um, we're very gr grateful to her for that. Um, and another extraordinary person is e-patient Dave, who I think many of you will know about, Dave de Broncart, who um, has been a, an inspiration to many of us and has kind of blasted into this whole scene with an enormous sense of energy and this cry, let patients help, which he has um, said in many, on many platforms now and, and turned into a book. And we, he is also helping us to, to think about how we can help, let, how, we, how we, the BMJ, can, can let patients help. So we've been ourselves um, trying to think about what more we could do, um, and we uh, decided that we would have another theme issue as our next, um, our next step. And this was last year, I think, 2013. Um, and again, Tessa was very closely um, involved in this, as was Victor Montori from the Mayo Clinic. And, and others who've helped us. And, and, and this, this sort of rather aggressive um, fist uh, was really to reflect the sense we were getting from patients that this was, we had to make a big step here. We had to push ourselves further. Um, and so this is a, 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 an issue of the journal in which we have an editorial and other content talking about uh, why medicine needs to change. It needs to change for its own good and it needs to change because it's wrong uh, the way things are currently done. So in this issue last year, we promised that we would, we would develop a patient strategy for the journal. Uh, in the back of our minds, we wanted to earn patients included. We wanted to have the tick uh, patients included, and, and we knew that was going to be very difficult for us, that everything we did would have patients involved. Um, and so we, said, we set out our, our promise that we would do this and that we would have a strategy. And as a result of um, publishing this, I can't remember the timing quite, but we committed all of Tessa's time to this project. So Tessa's been on the journal now for many years, running many different parts of it, but now her sole role is patient partnership. So that's a, a big, important um, commitment from the journal and from Tessa to do that. So we said we would recruit a patient panel, and indeed we did. Um, and some names here you'll recognize. There's Lucien. Um, Jan, you're there somewhere. Jan's there. Uh, E-patient Dave. The, the, it's a fantastic panel, uh, international panel of pe pe people who have agreed to help us with this. Um, and a few months ago, they convened in BMA House, um, mainly at their own expense, which is something I will come to. We think, I think we paid travel, did we? But they, we, I don't think we paid. Did we pay travel? We didn't pay travel. We'll get to that. Oh. <laughs> people, people came in their own... Not yet. <laughs> In their own time, you know, it's an amazing thing. We, we recognise this is a, an issue that we must tackle. But they came and we spent a very intense day discussing what should the journal do. And they didn't let us off lightly. We got quite challenged, we got quite criticised, we got um, quite um, difficult things that they wanted us to do. At the back of my mind, and sorry, just some photographs. I, I didn't manage to get everyone, but there's Tessa, there's Victor Montori, there's <coughs> E-Patient Dave, and there's Paul Wilkes, who is the chief executive of Patients Like Me, which you may know about, which is a wonderful organization which encourages patients to um, group together, share together, discuss their experiences, and in particular, which is a very central to what we do, involvement in patients in research and clinical trials. And, and um, most recently, he's written very interestingly in the BMJ about how patients involved in clinical trials are beginning to share their own data and bypass the, the strictures on, on data sharing, which is, I think, very interesting. So there's just a few photographs. But uh, one of the things I wanted to say is, is in our own minds, I was thinking, well, what, what can journals do? This is a, a picture of how unglamorous a BMJ meeting is. We're sitting 
you know, not in a very nice room, a rather old-fashioned phone, paper, lots of paper, <coughs> and um, reading articles, trying to work out whether to publish them or not, how, could it, how to improve them. What, what, what can we do uh, to encourage patient partnership? Well, as a result of the theme issue, the patient panel convening, um, we came up with a vision for our patient strategy. And it is this, to promote patient partnership by becoming the change we are advocating for in healthcare. So this felt it very important for us that we couldn't um, bully or cajole or persuade other people to change how they behave if we as a journal had not made that change ourselves. Um, and so that, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But the other thing was to be the leading journal for publication of new research, thinking and comment on how to engage and partner with patients, their families and communities to protect and improve health and the quality, value, safety and sustainability of health systems. So we want to publish in the journal the very best thinking on this, the very best research, the very best um, commentary, the very best advocacy around this whole issue of patient partnership because we believe it's the way healthcare has to go. On, on the, the change that we feel we need to see in ourselves if we are going to do it, these are some of the things that we said we would do um, and, and are doing. So um, we have patients on our editorial board. That's part of the patients included. We have the panel of patient advisors. Um, and we now have, as of last week, a patient editor. We have had a patient editor before. Sadly, he died last year. Um, and um, we've just recruited a new patient editor, which is fantastic. And the role of the patient editor is to be part of this um, conversation to help us think about what we should be doing to make our patient partnership real. Um, we are working, um, in, in a way, this is almost, in my view, the most radical, immediate step. We're working to have patients as co-authors of many, many more of our papers. So we publish, like many journals do, a clinical review uh, of a condition. Uh, and we would never, I think, have routinely thought to ask the authors of that clinical review, go and talk to some patients, go and find out what they want to know, uh, go and find out what the issues are that matter to them. And then when you send it to us for peer review, tell us what you've done, tell us, tell us how you've gone about um, finding out the patient view here. And, and then the next step, have a patient on that clinical review as an author taking the responsibility with you for the content. So that, to me, I think is, is, a, is a really important step. And surprisingly, in the end, it, it hasn't proved so challenging. The team who produced these articles on the journal have said, fine, we'll, we'll work with this. Um, we are introducing peer review of our research articles by patients. So you'll know that peer review is a system where articles are submitted to us. We will read them in internally. A small proportion of them get sent out for external review, um, and then a small proportion of those might eventually get published in the journal. And, and it's the external review where we send to experts in renal medicine, heart cardiology, statistics. We'll also now send those papers to a patient peer reviewer. And we're building up a bank, a, a, a database of patients who can help us with that. And that, that's growing all the time. So that's, again, I think, we're the only people I know doing that, and, and we're, we're going to evaluate it um, to see if we can encourage other people to do it as well. Um, we're asking authors of research papers to show the patient-centeredness of their work so that what we have found over time with the journal is simply asking the question changes people's behaviour. So if you say, did you involve patients in this research? And they can say no. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll say, well, we're, we're not so interested. Or they might say, yes, we did in the following way, and then they'll describe it. And then we can begin to get a sense of how the research community is responding to this. And my hope is that in a couple of years' time, we'll be able to say, we will only publish your research. We will only consider your research if you have involved patients in it. So that's, this is, the first step is to ask the question. The second step is to put the barrier up. And from then on, any research in the BMJ will only have uh, our um, support if it has got that um, aspect to it. We're, we're looking at um, improving the amount of patient involvement in 
both our written and our video content on the journal. Um, we are increasing the number of patients, although this is a slow process, involved in our internal decision making. Um, and we are, then the next pieces are about what we publish in the journal. So we're looking to uh, improve uh, visibility of patients' rights and responsibilities. And we're also uh, on, involved in a number of campaigns, one of which is, is patients included, and the other of which is patient-held medical records. We're very, very clear that patients should control their own medical records. I, in many cultures, that's a long way from reality. So having said we would do that, in this week's BMJ, the timing is perfect. <laughs> this is why I mentioned the alcohol. I don't know why I've got all these glasses here. This is about the World Cup and why alcohol is going to ruin the World Cup, apparently. Um, in this very issue of the journal is this editorial, which describes uh, our journey uh, to try to become a journal that has patients included at every step. Um, and I'm very proud of this, actually, and I think Tessa should be proud because she's been driving it. Um, I think we feel that um, this is one of our core values now for the BMJ. Uh, we have a number of other values, one of which is um, that for us there are, no, there are no sacred cows. I don't know, in, in Holland, do you have sacred cows? Yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> Lots. <laughs> we can talk about who your sacred cows are later, but um, we wanted to make the point that, that we will, this sounds very negative, we will criticise anyone. <laughs> and that means we will also criticise ourselves. Um, and so no sacred cows. Um, transparency, honesty, openness, striving to improve patient care, but very much patient partnership has become a core value for, for the BMJ as a result of this. So our next steps, or before next steps, are challenges. We recognise, and this was, these were things that the patient panel have repeatedly reminded us of, that if we're going to do this, we've got to really mean it. It can't be tokenistic. It can't be just have a patient here, just have a question here. It's got to really be lived um, uh, in what we do. A challenge of getting the authentic patient voice is, is one I'm sure you're familiar with here, that um, each patient is an individual. Uh, and then you get professional patients who have sort of, they may even have forgotten what it was like to be a patient, but they've become very vocal and very articulate, and they have a very specific view. And how do we navigate between the individual view and the patient view uh, across so many conditions and um, across so many cultural uh, differences? So. We struggle with this, and I think we rely very much on extremely good patient organisations, groups of patients. Um, obviously, you have then the problem that some patient organisations are funded by pharmaceutical companies. How do they get their funding? Uh, all of that sort of thing. So this would be perhaps a very good point for discussion, is, is how do you get the authentic patient voice? What do we mean by that? How do we evaluate the impact of this? Um, we're very keen to receive other people's evaluations of their own interventions, um, but we also want to evaluate our own, the, the, our own work. We have a study underway of the peer review that we're doing, so we're, we are, um, as I say, introducing patient peer review of research, and we are evaluating that in terms of does it substantially change the editorial decision what is the author's, um, the author of the paper, what is their response to having a patient opinion on their work? What is the editor's response to having this patient input when they're making their decision? Uh, so we're going to evaluate that, and as I say, one of the purposes of that is to eventually perhaps be able to encourage other journals to take a similar step, which we can say, look, either it has made no difference, which may be a good thing, or it has actually improved what we do. Evaluating the feasibility of getting patients to author clinical reviews, that's another thing. So we've got quite a big piece of work in trying to evaluate. Buy-in from editors and readers. Um, I understand that Radboud has been on a very long journey itself, and there are always some people in any change who don't want to come along with the journey. We on the BMJ have to deal also with our own internal reluctance, prejudices, um, we're very busy, we don't have the resources to do this, they're always an excuse not to do it. So how do we 
make sure that people really understand the, uh, the benefit of doing this. We're very lucky in the BMJ to have a very um, enthusiastic chief executive, my boss, uh, for the publishing group as a whole, who, who is um, really embracing this. When he read the editorial in this week's journal, he sent an email to Tessa and myself saying, fantastic, well done, and, and let's see how far we can take this. So that, that's amazingly important to have support from those around you, and especially from the top of the organization. But even so, there'll be people who will always not want to get involved, and, and we, we, we need to... Um, we need to just be sure that we can work out, we can explain to them the benefits and to try to make it easy for them to do it instead of a, an extra challenge. The other one is readers. Now, many readers, are, our readers are doctors and they themselves are not keen necessarily on the change in their own lives and they won't necessarily understand why we would be doing this in the journal. So we're waiting to get their response. Um, and my sense is there, there's a very vocal supportive group but I think there's a very silent, cynical group who, are, who, who don't write in, but are, are thinking, why should we do this? So we have to try to get to them. I mentioned about the fact that people came to the BMA house in London at their own expense very often and on their own time. And we are very conscious of the fact that patients in particular, as opposed to you know, Lucien and Jan, who are very well paid for the jobs they do and can afford their time, I'm joking. But the patients often have to stop their work in order to come and attend. So it's a very different model for them. And um, we need to find ways of resourcing this. And I'm very hopeful that next year, given the success of what Tessa has done on the journal, we'll be able to put some money in our budget and say, we need this much to reimburse the patients for their travel and for their time. And that, that would be a big, big help, I think. Um, and the other part of the business model is, is the content that we produce. Much of it is behind an access control because the BMJ's business model is a subscription business model. So libraries will pay for this, and we're very grateful to them for doing so. Um, we can't just give all away our content free. Um, we won't survive if we do that. So we need to find ways in which we can justify and support making this content free in order in order that more patients can view it, although again, I have to stress, we are not targeting patients, we're, we're targeting doctors, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one, that. And as always with everything we do, we're very conscious that this has to be an international perspective, that, that the, G, the, the BMJ is an international journal, healthcare is an international um, shared challenge, and so we're constantly trying to make sure that we don't just take the easy local near near us geographically uh, view that we really seek out a proper international voice. So we have a number of next steps. As I say, we're going to spread this across the publishing group. The BMJ is, is the flagship journal of the publishing group. We have other products. We have evidence products. We have learning products. We have um, compu uh, software for doctors. A number of uh, whole... We have a, uh, an international quality forum, which some of you have been to. Um, and actually, when you look in the detail of some of those products, there, aren't, there isn't nearly enough patient involvement there. So we're, we're going to try to make sure that the same effort goes into those other parts of the company that we can influence. We're going to keep pushing for more co-creation of content. Uh, we're going to continue with our open data campaign. This is a campaign to make sure that the data on which treatments are based, the evidence base, is open for scrutiny, and very often it's hidden. And we see that as very much a patient to public good argument. I mentioned the Too Much Medicine campaign. A lot of the time, um, we, uh, we're spending quite a lot of our time trying to make sure that medical intervention is justified and is appropriate. And it seems to me this is a very patient-focused campaign because we're really saying, you know, if you don't need to have a diagnosis because it's not going to help you, and if you don't need an intervention because it's going to cause you harm instead of benefit, we want to, we want to push for that understanding. I mentioned the other campaigns, the patients included and also the campaign for patient controlled clinical notes. We're, we're, we're going to be pushing for those. Uh, we're going to do everything we can in the journalism within the BMJ to cover good practice, innovation, where it's happening. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll want to have a, a, a journalistic article about Radboud and what you're doing again 
um, and, and other hospitals like you. I've said before, we want to be the journal where people will publish their very best results of evaluations of, of patient-centered care. And perhaps another purpose of discussion afterwards could be about social media, because that's where a lot of this conversation is happening. Uh, we've got ePatient Dave, I mentioned RA Warrior. Many, many um, very, very fertile conversations are happening in the, on Twitter and on blogs and other places where very often traditional publishing uh, is not. And we need to make sure that we're part of that conversation. So in the end, I think we are, um, we've done a few things. It's an early, it's early days. We recognize there's a lot more we want to do. Um, it, it is a selfish aim in a way to improve patient care because we all one day will be patients. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a not so selfish aim because we all want to, I think, create a better world. Certainly that's what the BMJ wants to do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fiona. I'm impressed by your talk and especially by the things you do as, a, as the British Medical Journal, the challenges you see and the next steps that you intend to make. Uh, really enjoyable. Um, it's some time for questions. We started the discussion with two sidekicks. First of all, uh, Jopie Verhoeven, the chairperson of our advisory, patient advisory board, and Gert Westert, at the department IQ Healthcare. In a way, um, it's the same um, uh, way we try as patient advisory board to um, encourage patients, doctors, and nurses to do things together. Mm. But I was wondering, your authentic patient's voice is a very difficult one. Mm. Can you tell me, did, um, in some ways, it is a matter of language. Could you agree with me? Did it change the tone of your articles by more participation of patients. Mm -hmm. I think you make a, a very good point. So, I mean, what we have discovered is that in order to write articles that doctors will read, you already need to write in a way that is much less academic, that actually doctors themselves are normal people. <laughs> and uh, mainly. Um, what I mean is... <laughs> mainly. <laughs> they're abnormal in many ways, but in terms of their, their reading, the, their preferred reading style. Uh, so we work quite hard on... Um, so, for example, th this, this thing, this print, we have the online, I'm just using this as a prop. This, this is delivered into doctors' homes. It doesn't go to their work, it goes to their homes. So it is something we like to think of as mm. a pleasure mm. read, not that they would kind of go, you know, we want them to really want to read it. And so we already work quite hard to bring the level of the language away from academic down to a more readable tone. Um, we're not, as I say, targeting patients. We're not targeting them as our readers. But we do want doctors to understand how to speak to patients in a way that will be a proper partnership and a proper exchange of information. Uh, and that in itself is, is an enormous challenge. So um, I think the language is absolutely crucial. And, and also, for example, helping doctors to explain risk, uh, helping them to find ways in which to um, explain things in a way that will enhance the patient experience as opposed to continue the confusion. So we we are trying to help to educate doctors in, in, in the language that they use. And does the patient partnership help in this Well, I think, I think the truth is it's early days. I mean, I don't know, Tessa, if you, if you have any more information on that. I mean, we, we, we will be very interesting to see whether an article that has been co-created with a patient as an author will be a different piece of work. I mean, we haven't got that yet, have we really, Tessa? No, I'm afraid got we haven't. Yet. We haven't no, it's, uh, sorry. Uh, we haven't got that far. I mean, I suppose what we have been encouraged by is that instead when we've go gone to authors to write clinical reviews, 
Um, instead of them saying back, coming back and saying, well, what, include patients? Who are I know what's best for patients. They've come back and been very positive. And they said, well, that's great because we already work with patient advisory groups. It's absolutely no problem getting their um, comments on board. And in the early stages, we're saying um, patients as contributors. We're not insisting on patients as co-authors, but that hopefully will be the direction of travel. And I think that um, on the few papers where we've had comments back from um, patients, they've produced a, an interesting and different perspective that the standard peer reviewers have not brought okay. to the table. Mm -hmm. And they've been quite critical. I, the one lovely one I had the other day was uh, uh, said, um, uh, well, you know, we believe in compassion in healthcare. We want compassion in healthcare, but frankly, I also want a doctor. What I really want is a doctor who knows the evidence and practices good medicine. <laughs> you know, in other words, you know, being nice to me is not enough. It was it was quite a nice sort of trenchant um, commentary. So I think we're beginning to feel the value, but we we don't know it as yet, and I'm sure it'll give us many insights. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Your question. Um, well, thanks a lot for your nice presentation, and I, I think it's really courageous that you take the lead in this so much uh, important uh, issue. Um, listening to your presentation, I somehow got the feeling that it is a bit of an isolated team within the BMJ, because you talk about patient partnerships and not patient-doctor partnerships. And somehow you could um, conclude that the doctors are left out a little bit, for the sake of to get going. Um, y certainly, you must have had some responses from doctors and from the physician community mm -hmm. to your initiative. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yes, my, my, it, it, we, we, we have to recognize that we get a slightly distorted view of what people think, because as I say, the people who write in are the ones who are enthusiastic yeah. or very, very critical at the other end. But the majority of people won't bother. They'll just, you know, or they may be happy. It's very hard to judge what they're what their view is. <laughs> we do know that um, we are in the UK, I'm speaking UK wide here, but in the UK we have um, a huge debate at the moment about patients' access to their records. Mm -hmm. And um, my experience in an audience like this is if you ask, the doc if you ask a an audience of doctors, would they as patients like access to their records, they will all put their hand up. But if you ask them as doctors what they think, they will be much, much more Open. reluctant yeah. to that. So. I think I think it's 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 almost <coughs> like which coat you're wearing, you know. Yeah, and I think yeah, yeah. we want to encourage doctors to to see that it's their responsibility to do this, to see that it will imp make their lives easier, not more difficult. That that may be wrong, but that's what we'd like to think, and that it, it, that in the end it will p produce better results. So um, you said about isolation. Um, you said, that, is it the word patient partnership that is one-sided? Are you saying that we should say doctor-patient partnership. Yeah, because I think that uh, patients need, need to learn a lot to, to, to perform a better role in healthcare, but also doctors yes, should yes, learn things. Yes. So there, there's a tango like you showed on the cover in 1999, um, and you run the risk now of, of losing the doctors if you, oh, if you focus yeah. too much on patient partnership. That's a very good point. Our tagline, we have a sort of, you know, uh, is helping doctors make better decisions. Um, which I think works very well for us because it's about it's about doctors as clinicians, but also researchers and in all walks of life, helping them make better decisions. Um, in the past, we might have thought for patients, making better decisions. For We've thought thought about saying helping doctors and patients make better decisions, um, and we we that's still being discussed. Yeah. The the difficulty with that, as I keep on coming back to, is we ourselves are not expecting to be read by the patient. We're expecting to be read by the doctor. So our job is to educate the doctors. But your challenge is a good one. And I know, Tessa, you have views on this, don't you? I mean, you think we should perhaps put that extra word in? Yeah. Yeah, exactly what the discussion was of whether doctors were there. Sorry, is it not on? It's on. To, to make uh, better decisions with, with their patients. But I think also, I don't think... Um, Perhaps we should be overly concerned that it sounds very we're for the patients, not enough for the doctors. Because I, I think the balance that, uh, is so much the other way. Um, isn't it? I think that you know that the balance is is still very much the other way, and we're also thinking outside the level of the uh, 
consultation, obviously that's crucial. Um, and shared decision making is a very, very difficult and complex business. And we, the more we look into it, the, the harder it seems to become. Yeah, and they're just throwing a few decision aids and saying, right, make a choice you know, <laughs> with you and tick the box, we've done that. And at, at one level, we've got people suggesting that should be uh, informed consent should be based on shared decision making. At the other level, you've got people saying, well, it's very difficult in the course of a consultation to decide when a decision has actually taken place, if it has. So I think we've got an awful lot, long way to go. But what I want to say is that um, we see partnership as important at all sorts of levels. I think one of the levels where it's really important is in, in the co-design of services. Um, we've tended to just you know, produce services and assume that they're in the best interest of patients. And more and more you listen to patients journeys and those of the carers, you realize that actually getting them on board. So I think we're looking at, you know, yes, partnerships and, you know, the design and delivery oh, of services okay. very much in the uh, research agenda. And there's been um, a recent um, series in The Lancet, which suggests that one way to reduce avoidable um, waste in, in research is to work with patients to define the um, research priority questions for research. So it's it's quite a broad thing, and I, I think that, uh, in, you know, good practice, the policy is there, the policy of, of patient involvement and participation yeah. is absolutely there at national level, at international level, you know, WHO. So I think it's just a question of a collective move towards mm. defining good practice in all the different components and I hope not a combative one I mean I think we've probably been rather over ambitious and in some ways but um, and that's why we will be evaluating it <laughs> and evolving this strategy and uh, um, you know offer it with yeah. sort of you know uh, not with humbleness but I think with excitement but appreciate that you know it's a beginning of a journey we want to thank Fiona and, of course, Tessa for this uh, 25th grand much. round. It was a great, great honor to have you here. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a reception. And I know uh, patients are included during this uh, <laughs> reception as well. Until the third Monday of August, because there will not be a grand round in July because of the vacation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then. Thank you. Let me take this off. Oh, thank you.